Ireland is blessed with a magnificent abundance of water. We're awash with lakes, surrounded by wonderful coastlines. And we boast over 70,000 kilometers of rivers and streams. And while few of us enjoy the rain, water is most definitely something that defines us. And yet, despite the beauty of it all, I've found that there's something terribly wrong with Ireland's water. Many of our waters have been infected by deadly pathogens. People are getting sick. And in some cases, it's life-threatening. Here, people get seriously ill from drinking contaminated water, particularly well water, and the numbers are getting worse. Given the furore about water in general, it's time we addressed all of this properly. Water has become a huge political issue. People are angry about the failure to address the problems properly and exercise about who's going to pay for it and how the job is going to get done. But for me, there's a more fundamental issue at stake. No matter how all of this gets resolved, Ireland's water system is broken and needs urgently to be fixed. At the root of the problem is a pathogen called E. coli. I want to find out why E. coli can be so dangerous, so I make a call to the School of Biomolecular and Biomedical Science at UCD, where they have a lab that is solely devoted to the study of infectious bacteria. Professor Wim Meyer introduces me to the culprits. This is a microscope, and it's set to about 400 times magnification. And when you look through it, you see little red rods. Every single rod is a single bacterium. Yes, wow! There's loads of them. The whole thing is full of them and they're tiny. Yeah, they're, they're very, very small. They're about uh, a thousandth of a millimetre. So you can't really see them with your naked eye. So if you look at water, even if the water looks crystal clear, there could still be millions of these tiny bacteria in there and you simply won't know because you can't see them. Amazing to think that these tiny, tiny little specks can cause such huge problems. Yes. Now, it's good to bear in mind that most of the E. coli that, that, that people talk about are actually, you know, harmless. Uh, in fact, they help us, uh, protect us against disease, help us to uh, digest our food. So pretty much every single person has billions of E. coli in them and they're completely harmless. What hits the news are, you know, the bad guys. So it's, it's only a fraction of them that are actually dangerous. It's the same as with humans, like the majority of humans are, are harmless, they're, they're good and friendly, and there are a few of them you know, that, that are nasty and may kill people. And the same is true in the bacterial world. 99.99% .99 of all bacteria are, are good, they help us digest our food, but there are some of them that cause problems. And how do you, how do you find them? How, how do you take a sample of water and how do you know that these tiny, tiny things are, are in the water? Well, we use a number of, of techniques. So this is a, a method where you analyze water and then uh, the more of these little uh, square things light up under ultraviolet light, so they fluoresce, the more E. coli you have in the water. So this is a very simple and fast way of, uh, of detecting E. coli. So the ones that light up here, they've got the E. coli in them? Yes, yeah. And how do they actually cause a problem? How do they make us sick? Uh, what these bacteria are doing is they are adhering to the, to the cell surface or to the surface of the intestinal tract, so of your gut. Now, most of the bacteria do this, and that's quite harmless, but the bacteria, these E. coli that produce toxins, they disrupt or destroy the, 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 the cells of your intestinal tract. Now, that becomes obvious by uh, development of diarrhea, and in worst cases, uh, bloody diarrhea. Now, if these toxins get into your bloodstream, then what happens is that they will start to damage your red cells, the cells that, that transport oxygen for your body. And unfortunately for us, they also accumulate in kidneys and may cause acute kidney failure. 
So especially in young children, uh, this can be quite dangerous. So um, you, know, you actually may die of it. As much as a third of Ireland's groundwater has been found to be infected by bacteria. It's a problem we all need to take heed of. The 500,000 people who are relying on untreated well water for their drinking supply are particularly at risk. Early the following morning, I take a walk along the Boyne River. With the mist rising, it really is the most magical place. No wonder our ancient ancestors treasured the land here. Not far from the river lives Nicholas Costello. Nicholas was born and raised in Dublin's Liberties and had a long career as a coal man before he became a Kung Fu master and founded this centre in the shadow of Newgrange. Water is something that's so important for so many different elements. It's also got its own perspective of importance to you. It has, people. yes. The air dragon is actually a water dragon. It's called Lung Ying Dragon Sign and it's a water dragon. So we have great respect for water. We, the whole of all our lives, are involved in around water. It sustains us, sustains the earth, it sustains the whole universe, water does. Without this, there's no life. Margaret Keegan of the Environmental Protection Agency joins me at Nicky's place. His well has been found to be polluted and the water is undrinkable. I want to discover how this could have happened. Yeah, it's, it's a common thing in Ireland. We have about 170,000 wells in, in Ireland. And um, what we do know about private wells is that they're vulnerable to contamination. They're unregulated in Ireland. They're not monitored. And um, many of them are quite old. So even in this case where this well looks lovely, the water looks OK, it looks clean, but you've told me that it is contaminated. That's right. It has been tested and it's been shown to have E. coli. And there is a particular strain of E. coli that we're concerned with at the moment. It's called VTEC. And we've had about 700 cases of VTEC last year in Ireland. And unfortunately, about 60% of those cases are in children and uh, they've been, many of whom have been hospitalised. The HSC have seen that in the cases that they've been looking at, that you're four times more likely to have got VTEC if you've consumed private well water that was untreated. So that's, that's a significant amount of people who've become ill because of their private well water. Where's the source of that problem then? Well, it's predominantly either um, animal or human waste. So we're talking about septic tanks or land spreading for the most part. What happens is that the contamination in some cases gets straight into the groundwater and travels quite quickly and comes up in our wells. Many people aren't even aware that they have a problem because it's something that they can't see. So it's really a good idea for people to test their wells. One of the main sources of contamination of wells is when polluted surface water seeps in where the well has not been built correctly. All wells should be built to best practice specifications if we want to ensure the water is safe. If you are concerned about your well water, have it tested. The EPA website gives details about how to check your well and what to do if there is a problem. Nicky Costello has decided to replace his old septic tank. David Kavanagh is in charge of the ceremonies. I can smell it. Yes, you can. <laughs> it's actually just been recently emptied. So there's the actual depth of it. Okay. Okay, so there's a septic tank there and the percolation is oh, somewhere over there. But there you can actually see all the pollution, all the black soil, it's all contaminated. Much of the treatment takes place in the percolation area. It's where natural processes break down pollutants. If the percolation area is not fit for purpose, effluent will not be treated and it won't be safe. A 
Across the country, different soils deal with wastewater in a different manner. Where soil is too thin, contaminated effluent can run straight into groundwater. Where soils are too heavy and waterlogged, the effluent can stay in the ground. In places where percolation isn't working properly, pathogens can easily contaminate neighbouring wells. How many homes around the country are, are problematic like this? Do well, you I think? just don't know, to be honest. There's about 500,000 septic tanks around the country. Now, they've started being inspected, but I said the majority of them are actually filing the test. Now, the main cause of that is due to the fact that that's not being regularly maintained and emptied. There's a homeowner here. It's a lovely Tai Chi centre. <laughs> yes. And they're getting a whole new system. Yes. Tell us about that new system. Well, that's say, uh, we've got to install a new biocycle wastewater treatment system. So the difference between the wastewater treatment system and the septic tank is that all the treatment actually takes place within the actual tank. A new septic tank or biocycle system, along with the percolation area and groundworks, can cost in the region of €8,000. In some circumstances, a substantial grant of up to 80% is available for problematic tanks, and there are income tax credits under the Home Renovation Scheme. When a septic tank is not working, it really does make sense to have it replaced. I knew a little bit about this issue, but having seen Nick's septic tank and spoken to Margaret, I'm really shocked. I had no idea what a widespread problem this is. And since the new laws in 2012, we're all personally liable for the pollutants that seep out of our septic tanks into soil and into water. Sources of faecal coliforms and E. coli are widespread. Policing waterways is a massive challenge. Donal O'Keefe and Pat Barrett's job is to detect pollution discharges on behalf of the Eastern River Basin District. Week in and week out, they patrol the river network, searching for contamination events. Unfortunately, we've come across down here a, a sewer misconnection. Just looking at it, you can see, like, this is, this is what you flush down your toilet. This is a horrible thing to be putting into our environment. And possibly further downstream of this, you know, this water could be used as a drinking water supply. So obviously, it's certainly not ideal. In the work we do, we, we come across a lot of sewage misconnections and uh, septic tank issues that are not working properly and, and unfortunately directly discharging into water courses. But we're gonna, we're gonna sample it, we're gonna log it, and we're going to send, send our information back, back to the ERBD. I meet up with Donal and Pat in Navan to investigate one of the River Boyne's many tiny tributaries. Pat immediately begins initiating me into their methods of detection. For the reasons that are apparent, this one is called kick sampling. We, if you start on this edge and we'll work our way across and then we'll do a zigzag. Okay. So anything that gets uh, brought up in the kick sample will go straight into the net and get oh. caught. So um, whatever little things are living at the bottom of the river, we're going to pick up. Them. Exactly, yeah. So we try and get uh, as many different habitats as possible. The aim is to find out what invertebrate creatures, like water worms, nymphs and larvae, are living in the gravel and stones on the riverbed. What lives on the stream bed reveals a lot about the water quality. Some insects, like mayfly and stonefly, can't tolerate polluted water, but others thrive on it. There's lots moving around there. Yeah, so we have... And there's loads of... There's loads there's of movement. movement there certainly is. I'm amazed what you can see, even with the naked eye. The stream water is literally teeming with life. But it's not what Donal wants to be seeing. 
constantly. Absolutely, yeah. The, the lack of mayfly and stonefly species is indicating already that, you know, this is slightly polluted. And it's amazing because this actually looks gorgeous. It looks quite clean, it looks quite idyllic. I, I can see the water's clear. Yeah. You wouldn't think of this pollution. What might be the problem? Well, every, every catchment has a local localised issue, so it's important to, to do a stream walk survey. It isn't long before we find some clues to the source of pollution in this little river. Lovely. Oh, there's loads. Ooh, gammy, this is blue roll. Oh, no, this is the toilets flushing directly into this stream then. Unfortunately, yes. It may look clean, but here we have clear evidence that's just sewage untreated entering the, the water course. There's not nearly enough of this kind of investigative monitoring of our river systems. And even when it does take place and pollution sources are found, there's not enough resources allocated to follow up on the problem. So the crime, really, is that there's so little chance of getting caught for polluting. If we're really serious about keeping pathogens out of our waterways and having clean and healthy water, then what we really need is way more investigative monitors patrolling the country. This little stream may be riddled with pollutants, from phosphorus to E. coli, which are harmful to the stream life and to humans. They're flowing directly into the River Boyne nearby. Pathogens and other pollutants will travel long distances once they get into the water system. I cross the country to the Marble Arch Caves in Fermanagh, where I hook up with Dr. Quiva Hickey, an award-winning hydrologist from the Geological Survey of Ireland. This is just incredible. That's amazing. Quiva, where have you brought me? <laughs> We're inside an aquifer here. Where this is the groundwater, so. We're in an aquifer. Yeah. And this is, this is like a river or, or a slow-moving lake. Yeah, this is a specific type of aquifer, which is called karst, where the, the rainwater actually dissolves out the aquifer, but usually it, it flows through minute fissures and fractures in the rock. Okay. But basically anywhere on, on the ground surface, there's water beneath us. There's a huge reservoir of water naturally occurring beneath our feet. This is just amazing. This is like a massive cathedral space. We leave the boat and pass deep into the cave system. It would have been between two, two channels. Above ground, it begins to rain and water starts flooding down through the rock. Two days of constant rain like this would fill the caves and make them impassable. If there's a pollution source above ground, like sewage effluent or agricultural manure, then the rainwater will carry the pathogens straight down into the aquifer. And from here, it can travel anywhere. So much water moving through here, and you're mapping groundwater movement. Yeah, it's very important to know where water's come from and where it's going to. So we can put like a little uh, dye, which is like a tag of the water, and we can actually monitor it where it goes underground. And then you can monitor all the springs in the area to see where it comes back see up. See where it's coming yeah. out again. Can we so, try a bit here? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. So this will move along in the swallow hole, move through all the cracks in the rock, and then emerge again at the spring. The dye Quiva uses is harmless to the environment. It's the same they use to colour the river in Chicago on St. Patrick's Day. Because each dye has a unique wavelength of colour, we can test for it in a machine. It's called a spectrophorometer. And I can put little samples of the water in with the dye and I can actually detect it. And why do we have to do this? Why do we have to trace where the water goes to, where it comes from? Well, it's very important to know where water comes from because if you're using it as a drinking water supply, you need to know what activities are going to affect the water, so how vulnerable it is to pollution. 
And how much of our drinking water actually comes from groundwater like this? Um, about 25 to 30 percent. So it's around a quarter to a third of our drinking water supply comes from groundwater. Quite a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Wait, where does it go to from here then? Well, from here, there's three streams that sink underground here, and then they join up to one big stream called the Clader River. Okay. And that then becomes surface water and flows down, down the hill. The Clader River is thought to connect underground to the Shannon Pot, the source of the River Shannon. So if E. coli has found its way into this aquifer, it could very easily infect a water supply hundreds yeah. of miles from here in just a couple of days. And I think people don't realise the connection between groundwater and surface water and that what you do on the surface is affecting your groundwater, but it's also affecting your rivers because this water, this will become a river, a surface river, mm -hmm. a few hundred metres down. It's a startling fact that's only really now coming home to me. If we discharge effluent, it could easily be infecting our own water, our neighbours, or our friends and families far downstream. I get a call from Eastern River Basin District coordinator, Ray Earle, who suggests that I need to get a bird's eye view of a river catchment if I really want to understand how easily pathogens can flow from place to place. Scale. Yeah, because I'm, I'm so often looking at maps and uh, models, but to actually see the real thing. Yeah. Wow, fantastic. Yeah. We're definitely really going to get a, a bird's eye view of an entire catchment. We fly out of Weston Airport and travel north towards the sacred River Boyne. Along the river, we see towns, villages, one-off houses and farms. Any of them could be polluting water. Similarly, all across Ireland, we're all having an impact on the water supply. Ray Earl has been part of a visionary new approach under the Water Framework Directive, where entire systems are now seen as whole integrated networks from source to sea, including groundwaters, rivers, lakes and coastal waters. It's a great way to manage our water in a much more holistic and effective way. However, to implement effective catchment management, proper funding is needed. In the last two years, new governance structures have been put in place by the EPA, local authorities and the Department of the Environment. And hopefully over the next few years, these should start to make a difference. On the ground, responsibility is spread across local councils and national agencies. It will take a real commitment to make sure that this approach works. It's essential that it does, because people are getting sick and pollution problems are still a challenge. 38 of the country's largest sewage treatment plants are defective and 44 urban areas are discharging raw sewage into lakes, rivers and coastal areas. Every summer, beaches all around Ireland have been closed for part of the swimming season because of E. coli contamination. So not only do we have to be careful about drinking water, we have to worry about swimming in it. When things go wrong like this, it's hard to know who to blame. You know, Ireland is such a beautiful country with so much wonderful nature. We should be confident that our waters run pure. My friends and I from the 40 foot swimmers should be able to swim anywhere or any day without worrying if it's contaminated or not. We all have a part to play in getting this right. OK, come on, girls! <laughs> it really will be worth getting this right. Water gives us life, and it's also so much fun. The girls and I are braving December temperatures of below five degrees for this precious dip. And I have to admit, there really is nothing as invigorating as a cold winter swim. It's simply beautiful.